Uh, it's so refreshing to not have to worry. I don't have to put on a front. I don't have to pretend things are great. I don't have to care what I look like. You just show up because they show up. And I think that that like close connection is invaluable. And to not cultivate those relationships can be detrimental, you know? And I think sometimes when we're not feeling good, we want to isolate. Hey, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about improving our self-talk and body image because it's so difficult. And I brought my good friend Kalila here to share her insights. Kalila, tell them where they can find you and what you do. I am a podcaster. I do a podcast with um, my ex-boyfriend and one of my best friends, Bobby Lee, called Tiger Belly. I also do one with comedians um, Annie Letterman and Esther called um, Esther Pavitsky called um, Trash Tuesday. And I love them both. You should check them out. They actually get into mental health stuff quite often, which I do enjoy. A lot of it's funny, but a lot of it's serious. Yeah. I I think that um, we just tell our stories. And, you know, sometimes we find relief in telling the most horrible things about ourselves in a more, like, comedic way. Mm -hmm. If you can't laugh about it, what you know, that's what I always say to some people. It's like you don't have to be serious all the time. Right. That gets exhausting, right? Which is why today we want to talk about improving body image and self-talk. So you grew up, just for a little background, you were a swimmer. How did that affect body image? I um, mean, a competitor? Well, I, I grew up in the Philippines and I had a very, uh, how do you call it, a helicopter mom. Um, who was uh, fixated in my sister and my athletic prowess. Um, and so by the time my sister and I were nine, ten years old, we were part of the national team. Wow. And um, what that meant was we were already doing two-a-day practices. By the time I was eight years old, I was in the water at 5 a.m. school. And then as, as soon as school was over back to the water I was. Wow. Um, and I think um, my mom, who was very um, really into fitness and into her own aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, put a lot of pressure. I, I, I grew up with a mom. I could hear counting calories and macros all day long. Wow. Um, I don't remember a time when she picked up a, a, a food and didn't outwardly count something. Oh, so she would like you would hear her out loud saying like, oh, I could have X amount. It's going to be this right. bunch of running numbers doing the gazintas. Right. So, and then I would see her buy Slim Fast products. I would see her buy Senna tea as like the laxative effect. And this was like in the 90s. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of conversation about eating disorders. I mean, certainly not something I could understand even at eight years old anyways. Yeah. But still, you know, that's, it's some, it's a conversation I heard all the time in my family. Yeah, totally insane. My mom was a Weight Watcher, up and down diet person. And I was even thinking about this recently. I don't know if this applies to you too, but I grew up in the family. I mean, a lot of my family was really poor. And so having food was like a good thing and you should clean your plate. And I remember like grandma's aunts, uncles, everybody like asking if I was hung hungry for more, like I'd already finished something. But before I could answer, it was like more was on my plate. You know, you don't want to waste the food. Yeah, similar, similar. I think that food is a blessing mm -hmm. and every morsel of rice should be cleaned off the plate. Mm -hmm. On top of that, my mom was, again, because she was so fixated on my sister and I being these athletes, she would almost create this like high caloric menu for us. For breakfast, say for instance, she would feed us pork chop, rice, two eggs, six tomatoes. I always remember it was six tomatoes and a big glass of milk. And I was in a 10-year-old body. And I remember think, telling her, I cannot consume this much. I am full. There was no such thing as full. Yeah. Also, um, I could not control what I could and could not eat because I was spoon-fed until the age of almost 13. Wow. So do you remember then the first time coming out of that, like making your own decisions for food? Was that hard? Um, yeah, especially when, um, swimming was competitive swimming was out of my life. Mm -hmm. I must have put on 25 pounds almost immediately mm -hmm. because it's like, I have some autonomy now and I just didn't know how to choose for myself. It, it was both like, oh, now I can get to do all of this 
but then there was a lot of shame and guilt around it. all decisions mm -hmm. uh, food related involved some kind of like shame or uncertainty because I just didn't know how to choose for myself yeah and that makes sense you're never given the opportunity so how have you because I know you work on yourself a lot which is you know part of why I love you so much because you're doing that hard work and it is fucking hard but like are there certain things you've done to help mitigate like negativity or food like issues with food what was yeah i i'll say it's an um it's an ongoing struggle still but how i've been able to be kinder to myself about it is um a couple things i don't own a wing scale i love that um I go by feeling. Mm -hmm. I tell myself if I feel strong, if I am moving, I feel strong. And I, I look at food as nourishment. I don't look at it as macros or calories or trying to, I, I've kind of just renamed everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't, when I look at food, it's like, I get to be nourished by this. Um, when I think of exercise, it's like, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. Mm -hmm. This is something that I really do enjoy. Um, so it's re having to reframe all of these things that I like held, thought of so negatively for so long. When when I was done being a swimmer, I had lost my identity of like, what do I do, uh, you know, to keep my body active? And I overdid it. I I worked out. I would stay on the treadmill for two and a half hours. Um, so it was definitely a battle to get to where I am now. And I still deal with it, but I am much kinder to myself about it yeah and I think I mean for me the self-talk is the worst like that's where I'll get myself where I'm like you're not treating your body right you know and I'll like just trash myself you're too this you're not enough that you're whatever um so I try to catch that early yeah and I think there's something that happened to me in my early 30s was I was diagnosed with a heart condition and that injected so much perspective into my life because not only was I unable to be as physical as I once was, I now had to worry about whether or not um, I was, my heart was gonna give out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I eventually got the, the procedure done to fix the abnormal part of my heart. Mm -hmm. But in that time, I remember going through a really terrible depression because I'm like, I don't trust my body, like this thing, I'm breaking down. The flip side of that was me saying, Oh my God, like I have underappreciated how well this thing, this vessel has served me for so long. And it wasn't until I couldn't do things where I was like, oh my God, you should, you should be so thankful for the, the, the air in your lungs. Mm -hmm. And after, when I got over that, um, I don't know, I felt a little bit nicer to myself. And I think the people I spend time with can also affect this. And yes, I'm responsible for myself. I don't want anybody to think that I'm like blaming my friends or family for this. It's all about me and the way that I interact. But I have noticed that back in the day in my 20s, I used to spend time with people who weren't healthy for me. They were healthy for themselves either, I'll be honest, but it's on me. And the more I've been careful about who I spend my time with and who I allow myself to be around, like especially long form, um, that's really affected my own mental health and in a good way. Have you found that to be true for you? A hundred percent. Um, I was very indiscriminate about who I was friends with in my 20s. And the only prerequisite was, oh, you down to party? Mm -hmm. I guess we'll be friends. Yeah. And when you get older, um, just your requirements change. Your requirements for yourself change. Um, and I've been so lucky to have sort of the same core group of friends that I've had since I was 15, or first coming to America. Mm -hmm. And I hold them so dear and so tightly to, I hold them close because um, I deem these people um, just generally, like they're good eggs. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it really matters who you keep around. Mm -hmm. And it matters that they are people who understand your mental health journey. Mm -hmm. And it matters that they are people who you can call and say, I'm having a mental health day. Keep a close eye on me. I'm sounding the alarm on myself. I am mm -hmm. feeling X, Y, and Z, and them saying, I'm here for you. Um, and then they come over and check on you because they know your history. Mm -hmm. And I've just, I feel emotional thinking about like how lucky I am that I have that core group of friends that just understand me. Yeah, totally. I think, I, I mean, 
because we lived in LA for 20 years and we've moved away for a year and a half, it's been a hard transition for me to find those people. And um, you make me cry. <laughs> I'm like, pull it together. I love that. <laughs> because it feels good to be seen and to have people know you. And um, I was getting together with one of my good friends, Joanna, and I was like, oh, it's so refreshing to not have to worry. I don't have to put on a front. I don't have to pretend things are great. I don't have to care what I look like. You just show up because they show up. And I think that that like close connection is invaluable and to not cultivate those relationships can be detrimental, you know? And I think sometimes when we're not feeling good, we want to isolate and then the shit talking gets worse. Right. And then we're like, why am I feeling so bad? Or why is this happening? But I think, you know, being able to call on people or have someone that you will tell like your sister who then lets other people know so they can show up. Sometimes you see that one person to be like, hey, let's do this thing. Let's make Kalila feel good because it's a it's a tough transition and it's hard. But then they were there for you. And then I, I would have been like, oh, <laughs> I was. Obviously. And <laughs> they don't want to cry or I cry. It's just so. Oh, me too. I need I, it. I, I probably cry every other day. And like not just the, oh, the, you know, 30 seconds of tears. Like I have myself a good cry. And that vulnerability, like I hated it. And you guys know I've talked about vulnerability hangovers. Like when you share and then you're like, or somebody we because we're online and you guys are online too like when we engage in social media and get feedback right away and people can be nasty and then you can be like oh nope like i talked about this on trash tuesday a little that like i've always been very soft and i like that about myself but i was raised in the country and i was super competitive in sports and i was like girls don't cry and i fucking suck it up and i want to be competitive and be tough but then i realized it wasn't really serving me anymore it was essentially like I don't want to be hardened so much that I'm like have throw polio. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to put yourself out there and it's hard to be online. It's incredibly hard to be online. I, I it's just um I I don't even have the words. I think one of the biggest like ongoing wounds that I can't seem to heal is this feeling that I People just hate me, right? And it's like, you know, you put out content about yourself and you you say things like, I accept that my life is up for consumption. I've been podcasting for 10 years and this is what makes me money. This is the livelihood I chose. This is the bed I made. But you can intellectualize it all you want and you can justify all, you know, all of the things that they're saying to you and you having to accept that it's probably been the hardest eight years of my life. You know, as a teen, I had a lot of um, trouble with um, um, self-harm. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, I, w I was in a, a psych hospital three times when I was younger. It was hard for me to make the transition from the Philippines to America. As a teen, my father was dying. There was a lot of things going on. And I found myself feeling that same helplessness that I did when I was 17, 16, 17. Super true. Where I'm like, wow, I'm 37. It has been 20 years and here I am finding myself just so, just rinsed mm -hmm. by the public. And it's fucking scary and it fucking sucks. And, um, and it's still something that I'm, learning how to get through nobody shares the full story online even the people who like share they don't share the truth you know no one wants to pull out their camera um on instagram and show like their kids throwing a wicked tantrum and then them crying like you don't think about that in those hard moments we put out one hour or a little video or you know it's like very curated so it's not the truth so then they don't really know you yeah so what do you do to manage it <laughs> Are you doing better with it now, do you think, or no? Um, I have my days. I have my days of feeling really strong, and I have my days of feeling, fuck, this feels heavy on me. Mm -hmm. um, but to manage it, I I don't read things. Like you said, like, over the years, I found myself not posting as much because I wanted to sort of protect myself a little bit better. But I'm like, why did I have to bend in that way? Why did I have to, like, I do enjoy posting. I used to enjoy sharing my life. Mm -hmm. I used to enjoy being silly. And, but when you're just like, every tiny thing is, you know, looked into, pulled apart, dissected, you're like, yeah. And I, but I think it's because we're soft. 
Yeah. And I want to engage and I like that. And I think um, that's been the beautiful thing for my community over time is like not allowing for that. Like I block and mute. And so it has become more of a safe space. But every once in a while I'll get thrown into like a shit storm of online whatever. And then I just have to wait for that storm to pass. But it is exhausting. It is hard. Since people who watch are all different ages, any advice for someone who's just maybe younger and online or dealing with bullying? We can deal with bullying at any age. So yeah, someone going through that? Yeah, so this is what I always tell my 14-year-old niece. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing that I tell myself. This place is just not real. Mm -hmm. Look around you. Look at the people you love. Look at your life in real time. That place is a make-believe place. None of those things that people are saying are true. And um, I, I think that um, especially when you are that young and that impressionable, being a 14-year-old girl, it's like, you know, everything can feel extra heavy. Everything can feel extra real, but none of it is, none of it is real. Yeah, and they don't really know you. I think that's something, first of all, for young people, private your account, please. Become please. It just makes it safer. I mean, even if I was online, I wouldn't have an open account. Um, I don't need to engage with that many people. I would just want to be my people. And then be very cognizant of who you follow, who you allow to follow you. There's nothing wrong with muting or blocking someone. It doesn't have to be done out of hate. It can be done out of love for yourself. Those people don't really know you. That's what I try to tell myself when people try to say that um, I'm stupid or I'm ignorant or I'm whatever they want to say. Um, that they don't, they've never met me. And then like the, the like feisty part of me is like, say it to my face, bitch. <laughs> because I know nobody would, you would never talk to someone like that in public. And you would never say something like that. Think about what it would take for you to get online and to spout hate about someone. Like that's a sad place. So yeah, just try to keep that in mind. But thank you for taking the time to sit with me. Thanks. I always love your insights and yeah. Where can people find you? You've got Trash Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Tiger Belly. I'm, um, my handle on Instagram is Calamity K, K H A L A K H A L A M I T Y K. I'm on Trash Tuesday. I'm on Tiger Belly. And yeah, that's basically where you can find me. Yeah, go listen. It's great. And I'll put all the links in the description and everything. Thanks for listening and watching, guys. Bye.